Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to webinar number one. Today we're going to be covering modular water and wastewater treatment plants. Uh, my name is Alex Pacini with AWC Water Solutions. Um, I'm the business development manager and water treatment specialist here. We have kind of cut this up into a few pieces because I know that there's a lot of parts to cover. So we, this is the um, first one that we're going to be covering on multiple um, uh, webinars that we're going to be going through this. So here it goes. Just a little quick background on AWC. Uh, AWC has been around for over 40 years now. We have close to 600 plants worldwide. Um, everything is designed and manufactured in British Columbia, Canada, and we have operations where we're shipping. And uh, on the modular front, it's very easy because we can manufacture everything in-house, get it onto site, and it reduces uh, a lot of the project management and assembly costs. So this is one of some of the fabrication that we do in our facility. As you can see, we have now, now that we've recently moved, we have now six loading bays we can go in there and uh, go through it all as far as fabrication and testing. So let's get started on the modular front. So what exactly is a packaged treatment plant? Um, there's a few things to it. It's not just having the packaged element to it. It's more of something that's plug and play or what we like to call as a turnkey solution. So you're coming in and you're not trying to source individual parts. You're not bringing in you know, compressors or pumps or blowers or tanks or nozzles. Right, I, I kind of call them widgets, uh, you know, in today's uh, digital world. So we're not selling a widget, we're selling everything that comes uh, together to, to make a full plant. That includes, and, and this is interesting because we do a lot of work internationally, of course, both outside of North America and within North America. As you're familiar, Chris, uh, you know, legislation will be very different in Louisiana versus Texas or California, and, and never mind if you're doing work in Costa Rica or Panama, right? So that's where we come in and we make sure that we follow what are the guidelines and regulatory agencies to make sure that we're complying with your, you know, local regulations. So we split um, all these modular water treatment plants into three categories. So the first one has to go into the potable side. When you're looking at potable, you're looking at, uh, these are kind of the three, there are more, but you'll have your standard tube settler, dissolved air flotation, which has kind of been our staple in a modular uh, layout or multiple trains. And we've got AC clarifiers, which include uh, direct filters and, and of course tube settlers. On the wastewater front, we um, these are the two technologies that we go after, which is the uh, MBR, which is a membrane bioreactor, and we'll touch on that a little later. And then the moving, uh, the MBBR, which would be our moving bed bio uh, film reactor or bioreactor. Um, of course, this is a kind of containerized uh, train just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And that's paired up with a dissolved air flotation at the very end to achieve a better effluent quality. And then we've got our, our skid mounted systems. So, you know, this includes reverse osmosis, ultrafiltration, um, and pressure filters. On the pressure filter front, there are some particular metals, say arsenic and uranium, where you need pressure filters. You can do it through a clarifier or um, some, some kind of gravity filter. So how familiar are you with a dissolved air flotation, Chris? Have you used these before? Uh, no, the systems that we normally uh, sell are uh, extended aeration uh, activated sludge plants. Uh, more on wastewater so that for for wastewater yeah we we don't do potable water we cater to potable water or we cater to water systems reverse osmosis and so forth with pumps that we sell um but we don't produce uh reverse osmosis uh equipment or packages or anything like that but we do uh we, we do have a lot of experience with um activated sludge systems okay so i'll skim through the potable water and then kind of get more on the wastewater front, which is, I know that's kind of a, a few of the industrial applications that we discussed. I can tell you though, that we are curious about water though. So, I mean, where's, where there's any type of water, water or wastewater, I mean, I'm interested to, to see what's available to, uh, to try to uh, promote any of that. Of course. So in the industrial front, you know, if you are trying to do any kind of pre-filtration, for example, even for water reuse. Um, this is a standard dissolved air flotation plant. So you start with a flocculation mixer. So you've got your flock cells one and two for slow mixing and rapid mixing. Uh, here we're adding a flock. Then you go into your dissolved air flotation where you're actually having the bubbles go through. 
So it picks up those micro flocks, brings it up to the surface, and essentially you've got these brushes here that are on the top that will skim the top of, 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 the, um, of the actual water source, removing anything. Now, of course, these have some limitations, so it's good up to about 50 uh, NTUs of turbidity. You really don't want to go anything over higher. I know this has 200, but it really depends as far as peaks. It, it can handle very high levels of organics, simply because organics tend to stick to the flock and rise to the surface. And it's pretty complex um, footprint. So you can see each one of these trains can handle about 1,400 gallons a minute. So if you ever need to go higher, um, you know, you can do two or three of these in a row. Um, we just finished doing one in New, in New York, well, New Jersey, actually, uh, North Hudson, that they're doing uh, 10 trains and they're going up to 25,000 gallons a minute. So pretty high flow rates. Um, then on the modular front, of course, we've got uh, media filtration. So what's um, nice about these is that not only are you still using your flock mixers, but you can vary whatever media you're using. So if you're going after turbidity, you can uh, you start with a sand base and then you can do anthracite or zeolite, which handle uh, you know pretty high levels of turbidity. Uh, then you can either go carbon if you're going after organics in a lower flow rate or manganese dioxide if you're going after metals, say iron or manganese to uh, precipitate it out. Each one of these trains can go up to about 1,500 gallons per minute per train. And you can see you can still achieve some pretty good log reduction going through them. Um, now, again, they are limited to as much as the uh, turbidity front and simply uh, because you are going through a bed that then needs to backwash. So you can see that there is a backwashing function to that. And then this is our tube settler. Um, when you're going with higher turbidity, this is what we're looking for. So a tube settler, of course, um, you, you, if you understand the way these work, we can go up to about 1,000 NTUs of turbidity and peak flow. You still start with your flocculators and mixers. You are adding a different polymer because you want to make sure that you give it the gravity. And it's almost reverse of dissolved air flotation. You're encouraging by giving it a broader surface area, we're encouraging the flock to drop to the bottom or we can take the, take it out of a sludge. And we still use a, a filter media at the very end, almost as a polishing stage. So you'll see it's almost like um, we're still using a very similar uh, gravity filter at the end. And we use it like this in a smaller cell so we can achieve um, higher flow rates. But the tube settler is what's doing all the heavy lifting. This is one of the ones that we did um, in Arizona. Um, this was rated at uh, 2 million gallons per day. One of the nice things with this one, it was actually featured um, in a Texas magazine. I believe it's called Global Wet, which uh, focuses on um, environmental projects and uh, water treatment. So this is one of the nice ones. And we allowed for a second, uh, we allowed for some space on this end uh, so that we could have a second train and bring it up to 4 MGDs, 4 million gallons per day. This is another project that we did in Canada for Port Hardy. One of the unique things about this is, again, we're going for the modular approach. So we were able to do it. The turnaround time on this was very, very fast because while they were working on the civil, um, we can be working on the pretreatment or the treatment rather. So from piloting to commission, we did have to run a uh, three month pilot on this. Between piloting and commission, we were able to turn this around in 10 months. Uh, and this plant was about $3.6 million, including um, including the building. So that would have been our process equipment along with the building. Uh, this was rated at 3.3 million gallons per day. And I have to say this is probably one of the fastest ones we were able to turn around. Um, again, going modular just makes sense because we can bring things to site a lot faster, reduces our project management costs. Um, and the you know, commissioning side, it's we normally have these up and running anywhere between a week to two weeks. So this is one. Of, oh, here's the one that I just mentioned in New Jersey. So with dissolved air flotation, while it is modular, um, when you're working with one of our trains, you can um, have them retrofitted into existing bays. So if you already have a tank that's been used before, or we have, um, you know, very specific sizing requirements to this, we can have it modified and make sure that we can retrofit. So in this case. We are doing a total of 10 trains uh, rated at up to 25,000 gallons per minute. And I think I might even have a video on here. Let's have a quick look. Oh, here it is. oh that's a little loud. Can you hear the volume? Can you hear it there at all? 
I, I don't have hear the volume on it. No. Okay. That, that's okay. Right, I'm gonna lower it's, because it's kind of loud. As you can see, the water coming through it, it's it's pretty bad. So on the right hand side, you're gonna have your flock, their flock tanks. As water comes through, it's bringing all the scum to the top. Um, this is water coming right off Hudson River. So this is on the border of New Jersey and New York. Water's water's not. I think the video might be affecting your transmission, but I'm kind of getting the idea here. So on the other end, that's the water quality that we're getting. And then from there, that would go to uh, gravity filter. You can see that the water on in there is a lot better. It still has a bit of organics in there, so we'd have to do some tweaking on the chemistry side, but it's pretty clear. So. That kind of gives a quick summary on the um, modular plants that we're doing on the wastewater and some of the advantage. I'm sorry, on the potable water and some of the advantages. Now we jump to wastewater. Now we do narrow our wastewater to two specific technologies. It's just what you're good at and you kind of stick to what you're good at. And that is the uh, MBR and the MBBR. I'm sure you're familiar with the process, although you primarily use uh, activated sludge. So in this case, uh, this particular one was a project that we did for um, PHP excuse me, BHP for a mining site. So here we are going with our pre-filter screens with our EQ tanks um, based on their, uh, th this wasn't even um, state policy, this was actually done by the company. Um, it had to be isolated in a completely separate room uh, for any kind of off-gassing. So we had our EQ tanks coming in. It goes in through the treatment train. So this is actually a total of two trains, comes in through the membranes. So these are the uh, membranes that we're using. From the membranes, uh, we go to our sludge tank. Um, we've got our treated water coming out on this end. Uh, no, excuse me, uh, treated water is coming out on this end. And then we have the sludge, we've got a dewatering stage. So in the dewatering stage, we can actually pull it off of the sludge tanks. Um, in this particular case, we're using a centrifuge. Um, we can use both centrifuge um, or we also have uh, belt presses or V presses that can do a pretty good job on the centrifuge front. For this particular case, the customer asked that we had an additional or a third train almost as backup. So if we ever had to shut this down for maintenance, we, we always had a third one available. Um, as you can see here, we also have the membranes with, oh, with filters and a sludge tank and everything coming off of the, the same EQ tank. Um, do you manufacture your own um, sludge press? We do not. No, we have a third party that brings that we bring it in from. Gotcha, gotcha. Is there a particular one that you use? um the name escapes me right now okay uh, i'll think of it in a minute okay it is a centrifuge okay uh no sorry uh, that was a question you are using centrifuge um or is this a, a belt press? it's a what yeah is it like a belt press or a v press the one that you use it's a i, I think it's a um no it's not a belt press I think, it's, okay. I think it's a deep press. I, well, I mean, okay. just for guys uh, that have more experience uh, with those than, than I do, but I know we have them available, but I was just curious if you, you all made your own. Yeah, no, we, we don't manufacture uh, them. This is kind of a small part. We, we kind of stick to manufacturing the whole plant and bringing everything as a whole. So that would be one of the things that we uh, bring in as part of the package. So, so um. Yeah, if you're familiar with uh, the difference of what's known as a side slip or an external membrane, what we're using is rather than putting the membranes inside of the tank, we can make it even more compact. This is a 40 footer, 40 foot container. This was originally designed for a mine up north where they were doing something like this rated at uh, 48,000 gallons per day. So we had our pre-filtration screens on the top. We have an EQ tank that's sitting in here. Everything is going up through the membranes. We've got our blowers and uh, pumps up here with our process control. And then we've got a sludge tank on the bottom here. So everything that's drawn out of the sludge tank, so within in a 40 foot by eight foot footprint, you can uh, be treating up to about 50,000 gallons per day. What makes it pretty unique other than all you're doing is shipping two containers. Oh, there you go. So that's kind of what it looks like in the end when we're done. Uh, well, not only is it shipping, um, 
pretty easy to ship is that you can actually um, we have another one that we are running at 112,000 gallons per day we used two of these containers so we put two containers on the bottom we can still do the same pre-screening it's just the configuration looks a little different we still do the same pre-screening we still do external membranes we have a longer rack and we can still achieve about 100 it was 112,000 gallons per day um, here we go back to the traditional internal MBR uh, where we're putting in our uh, membranes in here I don't remember the flow on the top of my head, but um, this was, of course, quite a bit smaller. But we can do the um, we we can do our pumps and controls down here, and um, up here we would do some of the pre-screening going straight into your EQ tank. So th this is quite a bit more compact. Um, then on to the MBBR again, as you can see, there's a qu uh, quite the modular function to this, and because of that, we can grow in size. So this is a two train uh, MBBR. So I've got our pre-screens with our EQ tanks on the front end. Um, it's going to be moving through the MBBRs. Um, this is in case we've got our uh, tank one and tank two. Um, you know what, that was actually a mistake there. This is denitrification. So we've got the aerobic tank and then we've got denitrification in there. Um, and it's going through our DAF. What's unique about this setup when we tie it into our DAF is we can achieve a very high EQ uh, excuse me, a very high effluent standard simply because we're going through a DAF. So it's almost turns into a polishing stage and you're not just drawing off of the RMBBR. So the sludge coming off of this goes back into the sludge tank with some recirculation. And then we also have some of the DAF uh, sludge that's also going into our EQ tank. Um, this one was done for God's Lake. I think I have some more pictures later on. But What's nice about this layout is that we have another application where we're using the same design, but with four tanks. So what we do is we add, instead of having two trains, we add a fourth train. And if you take a look at our EQ tanks, because this is a larger community, we were able to use the exact same sludge tank uh, with a slightly bigger uh, dewatering uh, stage, but then we just increased our EQ tanks. So here, here are some of the nice things about setting something like this up. So if you go um, into, let's have a quick look into the next one. So this is one that we were doing with a concrete. Um, with a concrete layout, this was not a retrofit. This was actually being done for a project overseas. Um, we were doing this for uh, South Africa. So this was going into South Africa. Of course, it's quite a bit cheaper. Uh, excuse me. It's pretty expensive to be shipping out some of these trains uh, down there. And in their particular case, uh, here we only have three trains, but the project was a total of nine. So there was going to be three of the uh, of these layouts. Um, so we had um, a larger EQ tank on the outside, which was being done outdoors uh, as a lagoon. Uh, we were coming in through our pre-screening and going straight into MBBR um, or, or splitter to make sure that we can divide the feed. And then we had our sludge tank. And again, we go back to our DAF. Um, I don't know that I have the image here, but I have another one that's like a 3D uh, view of this layout. Um, if you can't really tell, but this DAF is, is is a lot smaller than this because you need a pretty small DAF to handle this flow. Um, this particular DAF, we actually decided to do two trains so that we can, of course, uh, have the redundancy around it. And if we're operating one or two trains at a time, we can also bring this down and be running one DAF train. Is this similar to what you'd be doing in concrete or do you stick more on the uh, activated sludge and you don't go to MBBR at all? Uh, no, we don't do uh, MBBR at all, really. I mean, we just, uh, you know, the, the size of the plants that we normally are relegated to vary from, uh, you know, 2,000 gallons a day up to maybe 50,000 gallons a day or so forth. You know, it'd be a steel plant above okay. ground. We, you know, we do... Uh, you know, offer some um, cement plants, whether they are in the ground or above ground. Um, but they're all, again, they're all extended aeration, but we don't, uh, we don't go into to DAF at all. So this is pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay. So you, you wouldn't be polishing it up. Yeah. We can optimize a plant by adding a DAF element to it. Uh, so you add a DAF train to it and you can not only achieve a higher flow rate, but you, you can hit a pretty good um, effluent. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's a drawback to the yeah, that's a drawback to the uh, uh, the extended aeration plants, you know, the activated sludge, where it might you know at best be somewhere around eighty five percent efficient or so. Um, and in order to get your numbers down, your effluent quality down, you, you end up having to incorporate a tertiary filter of some sort. 
You know, right. it's got anthracite sand in mm-hmm. there to, uh, to polish it down, but yeah. those tend to be uh, expensive overall and, you know, like to uh, find an alternative. Correct. Yeah, this this keeps it pretty compact. Um, a lot has to do with the chemistry and how you're you're doing the flock or you're running the flock tanks. But on the wastewater front, we um, we tie in outside of the membrane bioreactors. We'll add a DAF to every single one of our MBBRs with uh, very good results. So, oh, what happened here? So, um, if you take a look at it, you'll see that we have a uh, MBBR. So this MBBR is one that went to um, Hawaii. So this was rated at 45,000 gallons per day. I guess it would be similar on the high end to the flow that you were running. Um, And then, uh, let's see, unfortunately, I didn't get to go out to Hawaii to get this one commissioned, but we did have somebody going out there and making sure they got it in. Uh, We didn't do the whole project. We did part of it. But as you can see, we can do some of the MBBR pretreatment. These are the trains, and then they had very large EQ. This was going to a resort and um which was somewhat remote as you can see the 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 area um so it was kind of tricky getting all the equipment there but once it was there um, this was commissioned in under two weeks which is you know pretty record time for a wastewater plant this is another project that we did up in uh, fort mcmurray in alberta uh fort mcmurray is kind of like the texas of you know oil the the oil capital hub uh here in canada so this went out there with the building. We actually, they needed the building as well. So we were able to um, manufacture the building and get it shipped out. So once it was dropped onto site, uh, this is what it looks like on the inside. You had your uh, bioreactor tanks. These are the membranes that drop into. And then this is kind of what it finished like. So again, another 45,000 gallon per day in an actual whole building. Um, I was making a presentation for this. I believe we were in Michigan and we were using this images and they were like, wow, your, your roads must be pretty flat and there aren't a lot of bridges to be able to go through something like this. And yeah, when you're going into um, Alberta or what we call the, uh, the prairies, much like the, the Great Plains um, in your area, we, you know, it's very, very flat. There aren't a whole lot of bridges, but there was, you know, some, some of the uh, <laughs> trying, trying to get everything to site. There's, there's, you know, always some kind of risks to try to get everything especially in that size yeah that was exactly my thought because you know in louisiana and texas everything's an overpass we'd never make it with that no you you wouldn't get five miles uh, before you had an issue trying to go through that uh, especially in texas so this is kind of the end result so we have um our eq tank on the outside here uh this is going up to fort mcmurray which can you know it's going down to about temperature wise to about minus 40 degrees uh that's fahrenheit so um, if you take a look at this, this had to have some very good clad insulation in here. But we went from our EQ tanks uh, going into the actual process building, and the process building had our membranes. And then if you can't see it back there, that would be our sludge tank. So pretty compact layout overall. Uh, we were running at 45,000 gallons per day. And some of the you know issues that we had in trying to get to site and have it designed. How big uh, is your equalization is- tank? Excuse me, can you repeat that? Yeah, how big is your equalization tank relative to the uh, the and the, the daily flow of 45,000 gallons? You know what? That varies site to site because it's very, it's subject to the um, on-site conditions. So, for example, in a camp, um, this is one of these larger camps, you know, you have 400, 500 people showering in the morning and then they leave for the rest of the day. So you've got a pretty much an eight to 10 hour period where it's, you know, there's no movement whatsoever on the influent. So what we can do is rather than oversizing the plant in order to achieve peak flow rates, all we're doing is we're making sure that our EQ tank is larger and that way the unit can kind of well, what I call trickle feed it. Right. So you've got all. Yeah, I guess when I'm looking at it, it almost it almost suggests that the equalization tank is as big as the treatment plant itself. Um, oh, Yeah. This was a particular different application. It would it would it would never really be this size compared okay. to each other. It would be more like this one, right? right. So your EQ tank is going to be quite a bit smaller. This this one was a little bit it was a was unique. If I remember correctly, there was actually two camps that were in front of each other side by side, and they were yeah. both feeding into the EQ tanks. And you know what? I might actually have this wrong. These might be both EQ tanks. And two EQ tanks are coming off of the two separate camps. Um, gotcha. th- this is a good four or five years old. So, um, yeah, I, I couldn't give you the, the exact requirements on this one. So this is kind of, a, again, this is just a cutout of what the MBBR looks like. So you have a look at what the inside is. So you've got your aerobic tank number one, 
tank number two, and then going through our DAF clarifier. If you're not familiar with the way MBBRs work, uh, there are some beads in here. They're almost like a honeycomb, almost like a wagon wheel. I thought I had a picture in there somewhere. But what it does is it allows for a higher surface area. By increasing the higher surface area and getting the right blowers and aeration through here, uh, you can you, you get your bugs, right? Your bugs doing all the work. And you can consume, uh, you reduce your BOD in number one, uh, then you're going into the second one where you're doing the denitrification. You will notice that the uh, tank number one, our cell number one, is going to be, I'd say, about 80% of uh, tank number two, zone two. So that's why you'll see that the size is, is a little offset. Then if you want to make it really nice and compact, you know, going back to the modular front, we can put it in, again, a 40-foot tank, 40-foot uh, building. This is a repurposed secant where you can put your zone one and zone two, all of your controls and blowers on top with your uh, DAF. You'll see the DAF uses a little bit more space in this case. And this one would be rated a little lower. This is about 40,000 gallons per day. So as long as you have a proper EQ tank and you can go through it, uh, you know, you, you again, in this case, we're not showing the EQ tank or the uh, sludge tank that would be added to this. Um, I guess a quick portion on the um, on the modular skid mounted systems. Um, I, I don't know how much of this uh, would really apply. So this is a reverse osmosis project that we were doing in Virginia. We were doing two of these uh, trains. So two of these uh, were going out there. Um, this particular case, we were running at 600,000 gallons per day. So decent flow. They did, they did we could potentially do about 600,000 gallons through one train. However, they were looking at having two trains for the full redundancy. And this gets shipped to site, as you can see, you've got your, your, your lifting lens there. So it, it gets delivered like that. And the commissioning, you know, once you get it there and delivered, uh, this was up and running, uh, you know, as long as you had your inlet, outlet, and you can secure your brine, um, th this was up and running in four or five days. Uh, this is when we go to um, UF, full, so ultra filtration. Again, we're doing very similar. The ultrafiltration in this case, we were doing it as a pretreatment for the reverse osmosis. So as you can see, you can just stack these up um, and bank them, however, whatever flow you need. So water's coming in here. Uh, this is part of our CIP. So everything that had to do with the cleaning in place and the chemistry that was coming through it uh, to try to keep these membranes as clean as possible. This is another project that we did in Hawaii. Man, we, we really have a lot of the Hawaii projects on here. I guess they're the funner ones. And again, no, I didn't make it out to this one. But um, we've got six membranes in each one of these membrane vessels. So as you can see, if we go here, we got four, two, four, six. So we have this. This was a pretty big bank. Um, this one was reaching two MGDs. So that's two million gallons per day of uh, reverse osmosis. This was a desalination plant uh, that went down to, to Hawaii. Um, so one of the biggest advantages, and I know that you primarily focus on the concrete side, but one of the biggest advantages when you're going with some of these modular ones is not only can you grow with a community as it gets bigger, um, but we can also, you know, on the manufacturing front and the testing, we're doing everything in-house. So by the time it gets there, it cuts down, and I, I know I've repeated this a few times, but it cuts down on your risk because now you're not trying to fabricate, troubleshoot, or, you know, manufacture something in the field. Everything is done in a very controlled and secure uh, environment on the manufacturing front. And then one of the other uh, sides to it is while we're doing the testing, we will um, re recommend or encourage operators to come out, have a day or two, uh, make sure that they are comfortable with the equipment. So by the time they get there, they've already had some hands-on training and it cuts down the training in half. And now they're not just getting what I, I call getting in a new toy and saying, oh, you know, here, here are the keys. They've now been a part of the troubleshooting. They've been part of the, you know, pre-assembly that has been done in the plant. So it cuts down on the uh, training time and the uh, commissioning time. So of course, we can't talk about um, modular uh, without bringing in our mobile. Uh, this was originally brought in as a concept design to, to deal with some of the fracking water. So this was primarily set up as a DAF for wastewater. And then we decide, well, while we're making it, oh, let's go back one more. While we're making it, you know, let's make sure that it's robust enough that it can handle anything, you know, other than DAF. Not that DAF isn't, you know, uh, it's it's already water that's that's pretty tough to come by. But we were able to modify it to make sure that we can do dissolved air flotation uh, for both potable water and for brackish water. So this is what we came up with. 
we've had this unit out in the field now for a few job sites. Um, we were working on a customer in Arkansas um, where they were bypassing their water treatment plant and they needed this for uh, three months while they were bypassing their water treatment plant to do some major upgrades. So this is rated at 200 gallons a minute. The idea was to use two of these, put two of these at 400 gallons a minute so that they can be running it for four months, three to four months. Uh, this is a trailer and of course uh, this is available for rent. I, I don't know that this would really apply for something that you might be using, but you never know a customer in your area. Uh, you know, we could get this out to you potentially in, you know, a week turnaround or maybe two weeks turnaround with everything that's going on. But, you know, this is available. No, that's certainly uh, that's that's very interesting because uh, there are some opportunities for that. That These other plants, I think that's that's always been some of the apprehension uh, has been what do you do in the interim when you're trying to swap a plant out and so forth. So, for instance, uh, it might be as much as. I don't know, maybe 70 cents a gallon to send it off site and have it treated. That's you right. Know, I'm not sure what, how much that would be per gallon uh, as a total. But if you had something on site, you didn't have trucks coming in and out to do that and then paying a, a vendor to uh, to treat that at 70 cents a gallon. I think that would be uh, pretty attractive. Yeah. So to wrap the webinar portion of it. Um, so. Uh, this is webinar number one of a 12 part series. Uh, full disclosure, this was recorded at a later date. So thank you everybody for listening in and this will be posted on the YouTube channel um, later this week. Thank you very much.